welcome to another episode of Oh What a Lovely Podcast, where popular culture meets the First World War. I'm Angus Wallace, and with me as ever is Jessica Meyer, Chris Kempshaw, and joining us today is Charles Fair. Welcome, Charles. Thank you. So we're going to be discussing the contemporary image of the British officer during the First World War. Now, Charles, you're um, a postgraduate researcher at King's College London, aren't you? That's um, correct, yep. The focus of your research is uh, temporary officers during the during the First World War. Um, how did you come by that topic of research? It was quite a, quite long winded. I wrote a, a book, um, had a book published ten years ago, which is my edited collection of letters by my family for the Great War. So we've, we've got a family archive that has about eight hundred letters from different members of family, and my grandmother who's the central character. So her first fiance was commissioned in. September 1914, had no training that I can find out. Um, and then the various characters, in, in, they had different experiences as officers of, of training. You know, one of them went to the school of instruction for a month in October 1915. That's her, her brother. Uh, her, not, her other brother, her younger brother, went to an officer cadet battalion in late 1916, four months, and got commissioned that way. And then my grandfather... He got commissioned in September 1914 uh, after 47 days in the Honourable Artillery Company as, as a private, had no training, it, uh, no formal training other than perhaps a short course of musketry um, until he went to senior officer school in, in the summer of 1917. And he passed that, was told fit to command a battalion at once, and then he found himself instructing at an officer cadet battalion in 1918. So I had you know, some very diverse experiences, even when that small sample of nine officers that appear in my book mm-hmm. a few years later i was talking to my alma mater which is a college in cambridge which hosted one of these cadet battalions and i realized that out of 650 or something years of college history no one had really written about the college in first world war when it had no students or, or virtually no students apart from medical students and um, indians and in, invalids as they call them hardly anybody there but it was being used as the base for number two officer cadet battalion so I wrote a case study of number two OCB in Pembroke Cambridge and it, you know what it what it did there and, and, and when I was writing it I realized no one had really written anything about the officer cadet system and its impact on operational effectiveness of the British Army is there a connection between leadership selection training and development and having form on the battlefield to me, that's part of the sort of missing historiography, the learning curve of BF in the First World War. Hence the fact it sort of then evolved from that article into a thesis proposal, and here I am sort of two years into a PhD. Now, um, I, I think we, what we should probably do uh, was that it give your book a quick plug. I mean, it's quite it, it's been out quite a while now, but what is your book? It's um, it's called Marjorie's War, uh, Four Families and the Great War. You won't be able to see, you won't be able to see that on, on, the, on the transcript. It, 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 on the podcast, but so that, that's that, that's what it was. So it's it, they're all officers. Um, some of them started off as privates, but it, it, you know, very t- typical sort of middle class backgrounds, um, professional backgrounds. If they hadn't left school, if they'd left school by that point. So that's really what the what the, the book was. So and with, with my grandmother being a central character, she was engaged to one who was killed in 1916, and then a year later. Um, she met my grandfather, had a whirlwind romance and married him after um, after having known him for only six weeks. As a complete aside, I mean, we, we're well over, we've been going for well over a year and that now, but was that our first learning curve um, mention? Um, it feels like we should have a little kind of like thing hang up on the wall of, of, of First World War references and we just tick them off as they come up in the book. Box word bingo, yeah. Yeah. Although I, I think we are going to come on to Jay Winter, who has had many, many name checks so far, <laughs> so... Should we explain to, to, to our non first World War listeners, if there are any, what the learning curve is, perhaps? That might not be a bad place to... I mean, do, you want, do, you, do you want to take a swing at it, Charles? Yeah, so the, there's the, the concept of the, of the learning curve, or I think learning process is probably a, a better one, is that the British Army gradually improved from the end of 1915, when it wasn't very effective in the battlefield. It goes through this bloody learning process in the Somme, um, you know, new doctrine is developed over the winter of 1916-17. It learns more on the battlefields in 1917 and finally gets it, it, it together by the 100 days in 1918 and is 
by first of war terms, the march to the battlefield, taking on defeating the main body of the main enemy in the main theatre of war. And it's now recognised that process is actually multiple curves covering different technologies, different systems and processes, but those overlapped in different forms. Sometimes it went backwards because you, you learned the wrong lessons, but eventually that these, these different types of learning eventually coalesced into the war-winning British Army of late 1918. That works for me. Full, full max. <laughs> so, so, so where do you see the, the, the officer training in particular fitting into that? I mean, you, you talk about it as, a, as the, missing, the missing story, if you will. What, where are you going with that? A lot of the historiography in, in recent years, I think, is really focused on senior leadership. So it's the, you know, the Hague and our commanders, the, the generalship, um, a lot of the sort of John Bourne, Peter Simpkins have looked at, you know, op- operational command. And we've had studies around staff with Paul, Paul Harris's his book and thesis um, and a lot of tech stuff around technology, tanks, signals, um, you know, a whole, whole variety of, of, of things have, have been studied. But it tends to be the technical operational stuff. To me, the missing part is that the army is a system of managing people. You still, you, know, you can have the greatest technology in the world but if you haven't got the people in the right place at the right time able to do the job they need to do you aren't going to achieve what you want to on the battlefield let alone the strategic objectives that you have in in the um in the distance so you know how does the army get better at managing its human resources so to speak and very little work has really been done on military personnel systems so to take the officer case, for example, in 1914, you know, the, the regular army approach of commissioning men after a year at Santos or Woolwich obviously is not, is not viable. 97% of all commissions in the First World War were temporary commissions. So early 19, in 1914, early 1915, men are needed to officer the new armies and the, the, the t- territorial force in large numbers. They have to get given a commission, but they learn on the job that there was no way of providing officer training at scale in the early part of the war. Um, there was lots of ad hoc courses. You could go to musketry and do musketry courses down at Hive. And there were one or two other courses, but there's some officer training that evolves through the schools of instruction in early, early 1915 onwards, a month long courses. So that's part of the reason the British Army is, is hampered in 1915, 1916. The officers at the junior level are learning on the job, much as their counterparts at, at, at the, the formation commanders are trying to learn, out, learn how to command formations. And it's not surprising, you, you, you grow an army tenfold, there's a, there is going to be that temporary de-skilling. So what I'm looking at is how do we, how does the army select and train and develop junior officers at the scale that it needs to be effective on the battlefield in 1917 and 1918? Now that's, uh, well, well-known documentary series Blackadder would suggest to us that the uh, officer class is obviously drawn from the uh, upper upper class and public schools, but I, you know, I, I, I presume that can't be true for the whole of the war. It might have been in 1914. Uh, yes, I think it was 1914. Um, and there's, there's very much, uh, I think, the regular army, a war office view of what an officer was, that if you were a public schoolboy, you knew how to lead. And it's interesting to note that Sandhurst and Woolwich, for example, didn't teach leadership per se to their their, their charges before the war. It, it didn't feature. It was just assumed that because you'd been to the right school, you knew how to lead. Leadership was very much associated with the social class. If you occupied a certain status in society, it was believed that you had what it took. So it was very much that you know, leadership was was a function of breeding and <laughs> class. And of course, that, you know, that, that does, I think, is partly where the sort of the black sort of type stereotype does come from. And it's not just that. It's, um, you know, uh, I, I think it's plenty of other things in popular culture that reinf- you know, reinforce that. Journey's End is, is a classic of, of that where, you know, the two central characters know each other because they went to the same public school. And th- there is, of course, a, an aspirational middle class Midlands teacher thrown into the mix, but is shown as being an incompetent officer and and incapable of leadership. And he's the one who is that right? Is he the one who breaks down? I can't remember. Anyway, older Mid- Midlands uh, middle class teacher 
who's not not the the who's not the most competent of officers in in that tranche. Uh, you've also got Trotter, who's a travelling salesman, which is a, you know very typical sort of lower middle class occupation. Um, and uh, you know he 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 sort of the the others talk about it when he's out of the room in in there and it's sort of Trotter. He's a, he's a good chap kind of thing. You know he may not have got the airs and graces. But actually, they're like, he's, a, he's a good chap, is what they, what they say about him. He's the one who has a complete breakdown, doesn't he? I'm not sure. I know Stanhope, the company commander, does. Yeah. Well, he drinks. He drinks, but, yeah. But, there, the, but I think it's Trotter who, 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 who has sort of lack of moral fibre, for want of a, for a better term, um, uh, in, in that situation. But yeah, it, it's, you know, the class element of, of who makes a good leader is, is throughout that that play and I, and I think it's reinforced post-war because you know the, the memoirs that, that come out it is those literate the Sassoons the Graves people like that who are from that background whereas if you're you know lower middle class or working class officer you write your memoirs getting published is a is a, probably a very difficult job to do so there are very few memoirs knocking around but from that that group so yeah the stereotyping I think reinforces and you end up with things like like Blackadder. We're you're moving towards massive utilisation or essentially grammar school boys, men, uh, and lower class, um, middle, uh, lower middle class officers. Does this create a, a recruitment problem if, if you're seen to be an officer, you have to have a certain class status? I think this was a probably concern maybe into 1916. I think what, one thing that when you look at the casualty statistics, the Casualty rate for officers increases over four times from the first July 1916 onwards. You know, the, casual, the, the, the line goes like that and then suddenly goes like that. And I think looking at the data of numbers going through officer cadet school and the casualties, I think there's probably a, a, a gap late 1916, early 17, where there's not enough officers coming through. And I think that was one of the, the challenges is that the army recognised it had to recruit officers from a much broader social class. And there were, there were, there were different, I should add, there are different views of what an officer was. So the regular army view is the, the classic public schoolboy image, but actually you get people like Lieutenant Colonel Errington of the artist, of the Inns of Court OGC and Colonel May of the Artist Rifles, who are, you know, those are two of the big officer producing organisations that really predate in the first half of the war, they had a very different view of what an officer was. They they knew that meritocracy, you know, you needed smart people, didn't matter what educational background they had, but, you know, they needed a reasonable level of education and intelligence and actually the character to, to lead. And there's a case which Errington of the Intercourt talks about, is he'd, he'd been asked to provide about 200 officers for the Royal Artillery because that was, this was... Um, I think if I'm, I'm not saying early, probably early 1916, and some chaps from the war office come down to look at the 200 that he shortlisted. And these two officers, they come down for the day and they interview them. All of them, apart from three, were rejected because they probably said, where did you go to school? What did your father do? Um, and what do you do if, you, if you, you've left school? Um, and probably if, if you didn't tick the right boxes, you, you weren't considered suitable. So you have this, this very different view of what an officer was. And I think it's that often territorial view, view is what tends to dominate in the second half of the war because the territorial force, it, it's the intercourt, the artist rifles, other class battalions like the London Scottish, post office rifles. These are the units that recruit predominantly from the lower middle class. They're, they're, they're full of clerks. You know, if you find one occupation that, that, that dominates, those those units it's the clerk working in office in finance or civil service or whatever um so it, it's this, this view that the, the, the territorial force has actually you know is really what dominates that these clerks are well educated they've been to a good school but it's not a public school but it's you know that they've got the education that sets them apart from many of the of, of the working class who, who, who probably are the bulk of, of the uh, the other ranks by that point. And th these are recognised, I think, within the territorial force to be good officer material. And I, I don't think the penny really drops for the war office till really quite late on. And certainly reverts back after the, 
the, the, the war is, is over to the sort of pre-war norms. Well, I was just thinking I, I've got quite a good example of that from my last book, which is um, an RAMC serviceman who he's a social climber, essentially, and he's desperate in 1914 to, to get a, a commission as an officer and joins the RAMC because he's in the St. John's Ambulance, not realizing that the only way to become an officer in the RAMC is to have a medical degree. So the definition of officer, I think, you know, shifts a little bit depending on, on unit of service. And by the time he he's able to be combed out, the only options are he, they keep wanting to send him to the infantry and he desperately wants to be an artillery officer. Um, so he decides to stay in the RAMC. Um, and there are other personal reasons too, with the fact he has elderly parents um, and he's the only son that, you know, he stays in the RAMC rather than get, getting a commission. But it's it's only in 1917 that actually the, the option for the commission comes up, that there is that much pressure on manpower that, that they're combing out sort of experienced RAMC servicemen. I, I certainly see quite a few RAMC officers coming through to get at schools, or RMC other ranks. Um, it's a yeah, you know, it's a it's a small proportion, but it's it's there. You can tell they've got good education. That's you know bright bright boys. And they probably got dubious medical histories. Is probably what it is. And they were sent to the, they were sent into a non combatant unit early on. And then as the manpower pressure increases, they're getting combed out to to serve in competent units with the, with the offer of commissions uh, as a way of getting them you know an inducement to to move with if if this change is taking place kind of towards the latter end of the war um and as you said you know in the in the early years and certainly in the the period before the war breaks out you know everybody knows it's not it's not a shock to everybody that you know if you want to be an officer you you really you know you need to be from the right stuff. You know, it's one of those unspoken rules that it, it's unspoken because everybody understands it. You know, it, it, it's a class system. How does the war office begin the process of kind of disassembling that to kind of encourage others to become officers or kind of demystify a little bit with the with the pressure that's on? Because obviously, you know, if they're going to, if everybody's going to, well, you know, I can't possibly be an officer. I didn't go to, to, to Eton and I'm not um, upper middle class or, or, or upper class. And the, and the army's, well, actually, we kind of, we, we really need people to be officers. So we're going to have to temporarily, you know, the idea of temporary gentlemen, temporarily disassemble this for the time period to elevate. How do they go about that? How does, how do, how do you sell it to the army or to the population? It, initially, the, the other thing factor was important was, was did your school have an officer training corps? Not all public schools had an officer training corps and not all officer training corps in the junior division were at public schools. And there's evidence that um, Tim Halstead has been digging out for his forthcoming book. I mean, Tim and I, I think, share the same view that certainly in 1915, if your school had an officer training corps, the war office is more interested in that because they that ATC gave you a leg up and and if you'd done some of the, the exam like certificate a or certificate b you, you clearly had the right mental capacity um and organizational ability to to, to do the job of, of being a junior officer so it, those atc schools are very interesting you get people like um there's a there's a school in grimsby which didn't have a public school but it, it had an atc and all um i think in the, the statistics you're 100 of, of of the men that got commissioned in that school by early 1915, it, it actually was right up at the top of the, the rankings in terms of proportion of men commissioned from those who, who left. It was only a small number, it was about 25, if I remember rightly. You've also got schools like the, the Cambridge and County High School, which is now Hills Road Sixth Form College in, in Cambridge. Now, that was another one that had an ATC. It was set up, the school itself was set up very much on the public school lines, the chapel, the houses, and all that kind of thing. But it was very much towards the lower end of the social hierarchy of schools in Cambridge, uh, but it had an OGC. So you get those OGC schools, I think, are, are, are very important for, for the war office. So that initially in 1915, that's probably where it goes to first. The, the OGC, but non-public schools, actually covers a much bigger chunk of the social spectrum. And I think even in 1915, you get many of the grammar schools start to provide a lot of officers. So, you know, thinking around London, you've got Watford Grammar, Colfs, Dame Alice Owen. So those sort of grammar schools in London's orbit, those are, uh, have you know, alumni that are, are, are typically clerks in, in offices in London. They're commuting into London. They may have joined a London territorial unit, that kind of thing. So it's those kind of schools are very attractive. And that's, so I think the grammar schools, people like King, Kingston Grammar is a good one. 
where R.C. Sheriff went to school. Didn't have any C, but it was that sort of middle class, lower middle class. Parents of boys were often professions, maybe civil servants, but they went to Kingston Grammar. And he didn't get his commission initially because he wasn't on the list of sort of public schools or schools with no GC. So I think that is where you go to initially, but there's still a shortfall. And actually, there's, there's far more schools than um, that provided offices. So if you look at the list of public schools, it's about 100 and over 100. So the headmaster's conference is often taken as a good proxy for what was a public school. But even so, there's some that were technically grammar schools as members of the HMC. But if you look at, and I've got a list of 253 schools by combining various reference works on public schools in the Great War. So that, that includes the AGC schools, for example. But that's only a tiny fraction of the secondary schools that were out there. You've probably got another thousand or so schools throughout the country that were providing a good secondary level of education to, to young men who are leaving at, you know, 14 upwards, you know, 15, 16, maybe, um, they were leaving with a, a good level of secondary education. And, you know, virtually every small town, small market town had its own grammar school. And those kind of schools might have had 20% of their alumni, may have ended up as officers, maybe a bit more, maybe 30%. But across the whole country, that is a huge number of people that, that, that end up getting commissions. So you, when you look at some of the regional geography of this like you know those market towns in yorkshire are a good case in point where you've got the grammar schools it's the sons of the doctors and the the the, the local lawyer and the business owners Batley grammar school you've got the sons of the mill owners who live in the big houses on, on, on the top of the town they often send their boys to the grammar school because they might be needed to do some work in the factory and that, once you get outside london i think you get a very different picture and it's those kind of schools that then go they might go to leeds university that might go to Sheffield and often it's about universities that, that were providing the technical skills that were needed for a, you know rapidly industrializing and, and, and technical economy and that's the bit I think the you know, those are skills that are needed for, for lots of different parts of the, of the army and that's the sort of bit I don't think the war office really understands is quite how different some of those regional geographies are. What are the skills that, that are needed to make a good officer? What, what are the skills being trained for? Well, it, it depends a bit on which arm you're looking for. And I think one of the, the challenges the army has is, is initially it's you get a lot of round pegs in, in square holes. And the army gets better at getting the, the, right, the right shape of peg into the right shape of hole later on. And I would draw the distinction between the combat command as opposed to those that are in non-competent roles so uh, or, or, or far less like to be in combat so you know obviously if, if you're say engineering signals those kind of skills you have to have a technical basis of, of knowledge to, to to be effective whereas infantry you don't by far the biggest number but you don't necessarily need those skills you do need to do stuff like being able to to map read is a, is a key one and obviously there are a lot of jokes for officers and, and maps uh, mm-hmm. still to this day Get the skills in that kind of command, you know, it, it's having the right the ability to make the right decisions on the battlefield at the right time. And that personal leadership, being able to spy your men that you might have to do because they, come, they may come a point in the battlefield where it's follow me. Um, you know, when, when things bog down as an officer, there are times when actually, you know, you have to do that. You've got to take your, one of your sections around the side, try and put in a quick flanking attack to take out a machine gun and you have to get up and lead. You know, if you're in a, in, in, in a, a, a more technical role, those sort of skills are much less likely to be needed. You know, but you need uh, gunners, you know, a great one. You'd have to have good mathematical skills to do. And you see people being rejected from the artillery because actually they haven't got what it takes to, you know, to, to, to lay the guns um, and do all the, 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 the gunnery stuff, which I, I know very little about. I haven't been an infantryman myself. And the army gets better at effectively filtering people through. And, and if they don't go into a technical arm, the infantry is where they will end up. I suppose the other aspect is it, that comes out is, is character. And I think that's where, by the time you get to 1917, the army's much more explicit on what behaviour it expects for its officers. Whereas, I said, you know, 1914, they didn't teach leadership, but the OCB system is very explicit on teaching what sort of behaviours are required. And if you look at SS143, which um, some listeners may know as being a sort of key doctrinal pamphlet of the British Army that really revolutionised the small unit tactics, that has a section in it on behaviour. 
um, how to lead your men. And it says, you know, a, a quiet word of encouragement you know, is, is far more effective than um, constantly criticizing and finding fault. You know, it's good, solid leadership stuff, which wouldn't be out of place in any leadership textbook today. Well, just being reminded of our discussion of Dawn Patrol and the the you know the qualities needed to take on leadership there um perhaps they could have used the directive in that film <laughs> sorry chris i was gonna say because i did a, a a research project for the center for army leadership at sandhurst a few years back which was about british and french concepts of leadership and my bit was during the first world war um which means i weirdly have the syllabus for the royal military college at sandhurst for before the war and it, and it does kind of pretty much tie in exactly to what what charles is talking about so if i read you out the kind of the the, the syllabus that it was um for the 1912 uh, course it was military administration and military law and together those two form one of the most significant package of marks you can get is you know the idea of a leadership through applying of of rules regulations and justice then you get military history uh, tactics military engineering military map reading uh, languages which was a waste of time as all of us know who've tried to figure out whether or not any british soldier understood what on earth anybody else was trying to say um riding and horse management uh, musketry which had barely any marks attached to it at all uh, gymnastics drill signaling and sanitation which had the least marks attached to it um in the the syllabus but uh, you know as, as charles said there's nothing in there really that you would say okay that is leadership we're going to train you how to lead men except for we're going to teach you how to punish them when they do something wrong and that is the core element of pre-war british military leadership you do find on um, the, the officer cadet battalion system you have have lectures that are sort of how to lead your platoon it's you know effectively advice from a young officer on taking over your platoon that kind of thing and there's a lot of good common stuff they're not necessarily examined on it they st- they're examined on the legal you know, deteriorate economy and some of the same things that that from your list there you read out they still come up but it's the ones that are relevant to the bf in on on the fighting front so you know that they are they are examined in drill um but the horsemanship you know doesn't apply unless obviously you're in the cavalry or the the, the gunners or, or a unit with horses. So that the syllabus is much more bespoke to what was needed for the times. It's, it's a four month course and they have three exams. So it does cover off the, the law, interior economy, there's musketry tactics, um, a bit on field engineering, obviously if you need to go to go trench and make a strong point. So it's those kind of, of, of practical skills that you need come out. But some of the behavioural stuff, I think, is almost there's a sort of coaching as well almost comes into it. This is where your platoon commander and the officer cadet battalion and your company commander, actually, they sort of I, I think they sort of guide people in what's the right behaviour. And they're, they're looking out for it. And if, if somebody is you know clearly not going to make it because they're basically a bully, I think those sort of officers often get filtered out and fail the course. The the regularity with which things like field punishment, number one, come up in memoirs. Um, and in even even in letters home and diaries, actually, knowing the law, when to apply it and when not to apply it, and in terms of man management, I think is actually not an unimportant element. And I, I think it is, and I think that you know the wise officer knows that being too harsh isn't it, you know isn't going to endear you to your troops. There's, you know there, there are times when harsh punishment might be required, but actually it's it's leading by you know personal example. Uh, showing care for your men, that kind of thing. And, you know, there are plenty of examples of, I, I think, where officers may have found somebody drifting off to sleep on a sentry post and actually they gave them a nudge or made sure they, they walked up, made enough noise to make sure the bloke properly woke up. I'm, I'm sure that happened lots and lots of times that people got away with something that, that would have would, would have elicited much worse punishment in the, in the regular army. But also showing that, you know, that, that you're doing justice to all so that, you know, cases of theft within a... It, within a unit that whoever is culpable gets punished and is seen to be being punished is is quite important. And and that sort of management leadership element of it, I think, is not not an unimportant. If if you look if you look at the responses of, of you know at a personal level, the, the personal responses of, of individuals to how they were managed. You mentioned the phrase temporary gentleman. I wondered if the military were actually trying to produce, does the system attempt to produce gentlemen? Or it, 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 you know, it's, so they they almost or, or even are these men, these uh, middle class men aspiring <laughs> in the system to be gentlemen? That's a, that's a good question because it's such a 
gentleman, I suppose, is such a loaded term. And obviously, what it meant in those days was somebody who's independently wealthy and didn't need to didn't need to, to, to earn an income. Hence, the fact you could be an army officer because you needed private income for your mess bill. That was starting to buy less and less in the even in the late Victorian period. The independent wealth was fewer people had it, um, and certainly by the time you get to nineteen. 14, 15, even the public school boys still have to go and get a job. But I think it's more the behaviours that are, you know, aspired to. So it's there's often an equation between gentlemanliness and sport, you know, sporting ability. But even that is seen to break down, actually, um, by, by some of the, 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 the um, sort of observers and, and sort of people who helped sort of form the OCB system at the time. I think it's more those sort of kind of behaviours. It's that sort of paternalism, what, what Gary Sheffield calls the paternalism deference exchange. And also this feeling that by behaving in a gentlemanly way, you are more likely to get the followership back. So men were discouraged from being too close to their platoons. Um, because if you are you know, too, too much informality, they, they wouldn't necessarily do what you wanted them to do um, if you were too close to them, if it's all first name terms, for example. So you do find officers... I've come across a couple who were discharged being over familiar, which that in a sense could, you know, the, 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 there could be more, more than one interpretation of what that means. But yeah, you know, there, there were behaviours that were definitely not considered gentlemanly. Alcohol and how you could hold it was one. You know, the, the, the cadets were exhorted not to be not to be seen outside, you know, it, you know at a cafe with a shop girl on your knee, that kind of thing. Uh, and some of that is is guided, I think, in, in the OCB system. So. That there's a big emphasis on, 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 for example, formal dinners. They would have more than one formal dinner as they go through the course. Certainly, at the end, pretty much any OCB I've come across, at you know, the end when your company graduates, there's a there's a dinner. And the Oxford and Cambridge based OCBs were particularly good for that. So it is that how do you pass the port? You know, what which items of cutlery do you use and what in what sequence? And that kind of stuff was important so that when you went to the mess, where in your if your battalion. You know, you may well have had your public school boys and so on who, who obviously you know, learned all that stuff at school. And that was important about just them showing that they had some of the right etiquette to fit in. Um, and I think that was sometimes a source of stress, I think, for officers who didn't feel they quite did. Um, just having to deal with some of this stuff and not feeling you quite fitted into what the pre-war conception of an officer was. Well, what's the age demographic here because some of the behavior man you know the behavior of suggestions might just be what you want to tell an 18 year old before you send them overseas which you you, you sort of assume that a non-commissioned officer is going to drum into to the men of the ranks but not necessarily what's going to be taught to, to officers is, is it is it just about making sure very young men have a sense of, of what's expected of them I think in some cases it is I mean you, you can see I think as, as the war goes on, you increasingly get the sort of the, the young men coming straight out of school, but often they're the ones who've been to a public school or an OGC school, and they've already, you know, that they've had a, probably two to three years of OGC at school, and they're going straight in. So they they have one set of skills, and then you've got often it's the older men who have been called up later on, you know, who might be in their thirties, who've had a, a a job, family, and so on. And I think it's often those ones who perhaps hadn't had the school experience you've come from the ranks and it's some ways I think almost a reconditioning you've had this time in the ranks you've been a lance corporal or a sergeant you've had a set of behaviors that are appropriate to that level and I think to some extent there's almost a reprogramming going on at that point it's just if you've not spent time in, in an officer's mess because you wouldn't have done unless you were a servant it's that reprogramming is how, you know, how, how do you behave when you're having your your officer's mess dinner behind the lines you know, and I've got several quotes of, of, of men who were actually quite grateful for that. They felt they didn't feel so out of place as they thought they were going to be once they got to their units. Uh, Aaron, you, you suggest that there's a uh, the official sort of, I don't know, official might not be the way, gov- propaganda might not be the right way of, uh, of describing it. The Ministry of Information sort of trying to steer people into, or, or at least portraying the temporary gentleman. Yes, there is. So I, I, the one thing I'm looking at is, the officers in terms of supply and demand. So as I said earlier, I, I think by the time we get to line 16, there's a, a shortfall in the supply of, of junior officers because they're not coming through from the traditional background. So those 
253 schools that I had, I reckon their total roll was less than 60,000 boys all in. So if you say that a quarter of those left school every year, some of them probably weren't medically fit or weren't suited to it, that number that's coming out of school, those schools, is nowhere near enough. So the army has to look at all this much broader range of, of effectively the you know, thousand other schools are all over the country that are, are producing mental good secondary standard. And that it's without having the sort of, the, the, the sort of, I suppose, the, um, the, the obvious cues of class and the school, it's, it's probably harder to know what to, what to look for. So you find that many units have to provide so many recommendations for commission a month. Uh, off the challenge for commanding officers, they didn't quite know what they were looking for. They just wanted a chap who was reasonably smart and would have confidence of, of his men. But um, if, if an officer, but for them it was it was difficult. And they still wanted men to come forward. I think rather than saying, "Have you you know tapping someone on the shoulder and say you go and apply for a commission," so I think there was a propaganda campaign or PR campaign. So this is MI7B, which later becomes part of the Ministry of Information. So MI7B is effectively the PR slash propaganda arm for the, the armed forces. So what its role is to write stuff, produce material that can get printed in papers, magazines, all sorts of things that portrays the, the armed forces and life in them in a good light. And so MI7B has this roster of writers that includes people, A.A. A. Milne, um, Patrick McGill is another one, that they had a, a roster of around about 25, 30 people that are, I, I got a list of, certainly at the end of the war, it's that kind of number. And um, I think one of the things they were helping to do was promote the image of the, the temporary officer in, in, in the First World War and certainly put over, put out information about what training was like. Because I think part of what you had to do was encourage temporary gentlemen or people who, who, who wanted to commission to apply. And you're not going to apply if you think you'll never fit in and never be one. Obviously, as the war goes on and you find that more men from lowest or the lower middle class come in, it's easy to see yourself in that officer's mess. So the sheer numbers alone make it easy for people to apply. But you're not just appealing to those to those men. It's very important, I think, to appeal to the family. So this is where I think novels and things are important, that... That, it, you know, that, that bond that the soldiers had with their mothers was probably the most important, as Michael Roper talks about in, in his book, that actually that, you know, that cha chain of communication that the soldiers have home is typically with the mother more so than the father. You know, I'm thinking of applying for commission or, 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 or the CO said to me the other day, blogs, I think you might be a good chat for commission. Have you thought about it? And, you know, you can, you can imagine blogs writing home to his mum, say, you know, oh, should I apply for a commission? I've been thinking about it, and and obviously the, the mother's response is going to be a key thing in helping the chap decide whether he, he should or not. And if she says no, I, I wouldn't. I mean, those all toffs and public school boys, I can't really see you in there. That's obviously going to going to put him off. Whereas uh, a mother who says yes, actually, you know, I, I read a good book or a newspaper article about it, is going to encourage that. I, I can see fathers probably less so. I don't think they were quite as important, but even so, I can see in some areas of the country where perhaps there were labor relations have probably been a bit more strained. I, I wonder if the fathers could discourage a chap from applying because by becoming an officer, you're becoming sort of part of the ruling class. Um, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, if you've got a history of the labor strikes and, and, and you're coming from that kind of industry, from the, from the shop floor, I could see some fathers probably not proving. I wonder if fathers might be more likely to 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 push their sons, you know, to encourage their sons, even without the, the propaganda that I, I think you're probably quite right about certain cultures seeing management, for want of a better word, as being inappropriate. But others, perhaps, you know, a, a small shop owner, you know, thinking my son, the officer would be quite quite a good boasting. I, I think you, you definitely get that. I'm not, I think that's probably why that sort of class, it's the, it's the small business owners or, or maybe even bigger bits so into a commerce and obviously that that distinction between you know the, the, the public school boy that upper class in you know, a commerce was a slightly dirty word um you know, if you're in trade and it was looked down on but actually that that sort of the more nouveau nouveau riche type um you know self-made men you know those 
chaps were a, a much bigger, a rising social class. And I think that's why looking at the economies outside London is really so important. You know, it's your mill owners in, in Lancashire and Yorkshire, for example, who probably them, themselves and might have been to a grammar school. They were sending their schools, perhaps to the local grammar school, a minor public school, probably not to one of the big public schools unless you had a lot of money and wanted to send them right down, down south. You know, it more likely to be in that local economy and then perhaps going into, say, Leeds or Sheffield University. Well, I'm just, I'm just wondering, how much does your research push beyond the war years? Because thinking about the temporariness of temporary gentlemen um, and what happens after the war, and my understanding is that, first of all, there's, there's a real snobbery about people who keep their military titles after the war if they have come through this route into to officership if they're not members you know if they're not still in the military if they've left service but keep hold of their um title because they are having pretensions to, to rank that that they haven't they're not properly part of that it is temporary but also that idea of commerce there's a there's a in Dorothy L. Sayers and Pleasant at the Bologna Club, there's this wonderful discussion of, no, sorry, Murder Must Advertise, where they're talking about a, a character who um, appears to be quite uh, upper class, but he's working in, a, in, in commerce in an advertising agency and talks about being one of these gilded John, Johnnies who, who'd been an officer who went into to set car salesmanship after the war and the bottom's fallen out of that market. So he's having to push around and, and earn his own living. This idea that, that the gentlemanship of, of being an officer very much is a temporary status uh, seems to reassert itself after the war, particularly in relation to commerce. I, I think it does. I mean, the army does default to its pre-war role of being a colonial police force. I think there's an expectation in, more broadly in society that people will default back to where they were when it started almost as if nothing had happened, which to me seems a bit, a, a bit, a bit bizarre, but I think maybe that was just the way the world was then. You, 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 you know, people automatically sort of expect to slot back into the class and position that they had before. And you do have this this problem, which Martin Petter talks about in, a, in an article you know, from 30 plus years ago, which is about rank status and ex-officer problem. And it was a big problem in that interwar period of having men who had, you know, they'd been captains, majors, lieutenant colonels even, but not from the right background. And they were de-officered. And they'd had far more responsibility in the First World War at quite a young age than they would, would get afterwards. And it was often a matter of luck. You know, so the, the, the destitution that, amongst ex-officers was a significant social problem, which is why British Legion and um, those welfare bodies are so important. Um, some of them were devoted exclusively to officers. Yeah, it, it is kind of kind of shocking in many ways. And I don't think the, the army itself really learns from that experience that, that, that in 1918 it found a lot of very talented officers not from traditional routes. In the Second World War, it, the lesson it learns is don't do a Kitchener and raise the new armies because that will end up meaning all of your potential officers will get killed in the ranks. And it, you know, so we, we don't have that in the second world war. It's much more controlling. If you went to the right kind of school, you were automatically expected to go to an officer cadet training unit, which you might, might still fail, but that, that sort of the right type of chap was, was guarded from the offset and expected to go for commission without even having a chance to go in the ranks. With that kind of the in regards to the both the temporary nature of it and the and the changes in the Second World War, I mean the, the with the temporary bit, I've said in, I can't remember if I said it on here before, but in other places that you know the First World War is a war of preservation. You know nobody's fighting for an amazing 1918; they're fighting for a maintaining of 1914. And 1914 has a very clear class structure. So once the war is over, that's that's what we're going back to. Um, and what you see. In the Second World War is that introduction. It's the, is it the War Office Selection Boards, which is the kind of the first time where I, in my head, it's a bunch of kind of war officer and officer types sat in like a smoky room in like 1942, slowly coming to the conclusion that maybe it's possible that we can consider that the people we went to school with might not 100 percent be the best people for every single job, um, because you get that whole thing where there are so many people who are going for for officer interviews and consistently failing um, and being and not being appointed because they didn't go to the same 
connections to the same school and the like as the people interviewing them. And then you end up with this, actually, let us define what we want in a leader. Let us define what we think the key skills of an officer are and then appoint people who match those um, as, a, as a shift away from what previously had existed. It, it is. So that, that's where I think the War Office Selection Board that comes in. in um, it's actually 1941. I mean, it's, it's the Ronald Adam, uh, the National General, revamps the officer selection and training in the Second World War. In 1941, he comes in and shakes it up because people aren't getting through for exactly that reason. And I think the Second World War, the army is different. It's, become, it's much more technical still. You've also got competition for Royal Air Force, where a lot of very technically qualified men end up in the RAF, probably, and I think probably suits them because it hasn't got the social class issues that I think the army has. But the army still needs a lot more of these technically qualified men because the, you know the, the gunners and all the other technical roles are that much bigger still than they were in 1918 you need the remi and the you know the, the electrical engineers those men who do have those skills haven't gone to public school if you're going to be you know running a light aid attachment the remi fixing fixing tanks you probably haven't been to public school you know you've you've you've, you've learned your trade through motor engineering or whatever it is and the army still needs those and i think by the end of the second world war it, it it's certainly, I think, pretty good at getting the, the right kind of peg in the right hole, much the same way it was in the First World War. Um, it's just start, the starting point was different. So I, th- I think by 1918, you know, we've, we've got a pretty effective system. It, it, it's good at filtering out the ones who should not have been officers in the first place. And it gets the ones who perhaps weren't suited to one role into the right role for them or the right role for the army, if, even if it is the infantry. I mean, the infantry tends to be the default in 1918, if you haven't got skills that suit you to something else, you end up as a in the infantry. I wonder if there, is there a, is a sort of literary act to the remembrance of these temporary gentlemen, or or, or is there no act whatsoever? The war finishes and they're forgotten because clearly they don't fit into the lines led by donkeys narrative that you get in uh, Black Adder. Is there an act to their to their remembrance? Um, I don't think there's 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 that much of one because they're just not as visible in the. In, in the post-war memoirs. I mean, you know, we're, we're, our view, I think, is predominantly the Graves and Sassoon and those kind of people who, you know, we've all read and enjoyed. Those kind of officers, that they, they just don't get as much out. People, Henry Ogle is one, it is, is one fairly well-known account. And he went to a, um, you know, a sort of very typical uh, middle-class background. Um, you have people like R.C. Sheriff. He's on that, R.C. Sheriff's on that borderline. I mean, it's what I call that grey area of school, you know, Strong educational background, but no HEC. Henry Ogle's one. Norman Collins is another. There are a few memoirs, but they're, they're so few and far between. I don't think the temporary gentlemen themselves have any sort of canon that they could say they control, and they're putting their own sort of image forward. There are a couple of examples, I think, where there's a there's a, there's a play, for example, that comes out in 1919 which is called Temporary Gentleman, a comedy in three acts. And the, the chapter is H. Chef Maltby. Uh, now, Maltby is a, um, he's a member of the, of the pre-war London theatre background. He's from a lower, very much lower social middle class background. He goes to the Army Service Corps and is commissioned from that. And he writes this, this play called A Temporary Gentleman. And the title role is, is a chap called Lieutenant Walter Hope in the Army Service Corps. And it's basically about him and his wife you know, how they start off trying to maintain the airs and graces of having been, been commissioned. Um, and it all goes sadly wrong. They make sort of faux pas and, and that kind of thing. You, you can sort of, and I have, have to admit, I've not read it. It's one of those things I need, I need to have a look at. But there's enough in the press reviews, you, you get what the arc is. And eventually, he, as a penny drops, he realises, actually, let's stop all this. I need to get back to, you know, where I belong. And that's where I'm happy then I, I can get the kind of job I was doing before the war. And actually, that, that's, that's his arc. So it maybe kind of reflects Mal- Maltby's own um, autobiography, um, which is another thing on my, on my reading list. But it's very much a case of, you know, these are men, as Martin Petter would call it, being de-officered, and they actually have to drop those things they may have picked up t- to fit back in. And I think yeah. that is really what the, if, if there's any arc at all, that's probably what it is. Um, so that play was 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 quite a popular thing. It, it, it premiered in March 1919, and, and it toured all around the country over that spring and summer. And I think that's one of those things that might have helped sort of set the the the, the narrative arc for that. 
someone's written about that play because I've, I've read about that play. Your, your description of it is ringing all sorts of bells. But I'm wondering, is there, talking about the, the, uh, the, the lack of, of memoirs in the interwar period, and I'd be interested to go back to, to Ian Isherwood's discussion of, of what was actually being published, because I think there are quite a lot of forgotten memoirs, the ones that didn't get much cultural traction at the time, perhaps. But um, is there any sort of temporary officer, temporary officer revival in that 1960s period that Dan Todman sort of identifies when people start writing their memoirs? Um, you know, they've retired and, and, and they start returning to the war. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure where things like Henry Ogle, I think, comes comes out, actually. I mean, it's, it's that time you get a few of those coming out because they those are men who've then they've spent 30, 40, 50 years doing other things, but nothing to do with it. Their memoirs come out in the, late on in life when they've perhaps been successful, they can get this stuff published. And they, they, they've achieved social mobility in a way that they couldn't, they couldn't have done in the 1920s. So I think, yes, there's definitely some of that comes out, but I don't think it's been an, anything like the quantity needed to really shift the narrative. Because I'm, I'm just wondering, I, I, I'm currently well, listening on audio tape, actually, to Reginald Hill's The Wood Beyond, which is his the sort of culmination of his obsession with the First World War that um, at some point we, we might need to do an episode on on that. But um, it, so it's his, his First World War novel, but it's being written in the context of the Falklands is when it comes out. And there's, a, you know, on this, my sort of fourth or fifth return to it, I'm starting to realise just how much that is is shaping the ideas of the British Army in the Falklands War, the class structure in in Britain at the time, how much that's shaping his understanding of, of the First World War rather than an actual knowledge of, of the war his his views on Hague are, are really quite amusing actually um so I, I do you know for those later narratives I wondered the extent to which they are are being shaped by by the the culture cultural shift of the 1960s um as much as as by the actual experiences of of de-skilling in the 1920s it's yeah it's possible isn't it I mean it, there's the but you've got the whole sort of anti-war thing coming out at the time of Vietnam and all that kind of thing shaping it. Um, and I think the army, certainly my experience of the, I was in the TA army reserves, they are now um, in the late eighties and early nineties. And, you know, my experience then was the army was certainly, you know, the, the, the class thing still very much present then. And there was definitely, and I haven't been in infantry units, was definitely looking down on, you know, the, 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 the Royal Corps transport and, uh, uh, and, 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 and some of the more technical Units. You, you could tell, even in my office's mess, where people had gone to school. And I remember I had an attachment to one battalion in Cyprus at that time, and the, the, the so I was just out there for a couple of weeks as a potential officer. And it was just I was sort of approved of because I've been to the right kind of university and and, and school. And there was a chap who'd, who'd been commissioned into that battalion from somewhere that wasn't quite deemed to be the right type and there are all sorts of rather meaner sides about this chat behind and some of it may have been behavioral things I, d- I don't know but it was it was i felt mm, okay this you could see this reflecting back on it now you could see this perception of class there so strong that this chat wasn't quite you know you non-you i think would be the was it jessica mitford the, um yeah. very non-you kind of thing and, and just some behavioral things that you could tell from what they were saying he, he it was Either saying or doing or, or or speaking weren't quite right for for that for that unit. Um, it was it was, a bit, it was all a bit um, a, a bit weird, I think, uh, to, to me to me at the time as um, you know as a 18, 20, 19 year old student as I was. So, so definitely reversion over the course of the twentieth century. Yeah, definitely reversion. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 and even when you look at the stats today of of the portion of Santos Gradio that's coming from. Um, you know, private school background. It's it's still, you know, fifty percent plus. Um, you know, the, the British Army in nineteen eighteen at the junior officer level, I think was very meritocratic. You got people who who'd been to cadet school. They typically been in the ranks in active service. You know, they they'd learnt that job as a private soldier, junior NCO. They'd been over the top. Um, they've certainly done raids and things like that in many cases. You know, these 
chaps knew their job and they knew what it was like to be led. And then they had four months at cadet school, maybe more, maybe up to six months if you were graduating in summer of 1918. And then you'd probably go to a battalion in the UK for um, one of the training reserve battalions, typically. You'd go there for two or three months to hone your skills further. So by the time you got to the Western Front in middle of 1918, for example, you'd had a lot of experience, you know, far more than your your equivalents would have done in September 1914. You know, so that individual learning curve those people that went through was, you know, it, it, it had evolved over a couple of years. But, you know, the, the, the six weeks myth has been, I think, pretty much well killed off by now. You know, these men had several months of post-commissioned service on average. So when you went into action, say, the Battle of the Cell in October 1918, you know, these are men who knew their jobs in a, you know, in a, I think a pretty deep way. You know, they've been living and breathing, you know, what it means to, to soldier and to be an officer for, you know, often by that point, three or four years. You know, it, it, it was often that typically the volunteers of 1914 and 15 were the ones who were commanding platoons in late 1918. And these are the guys, I think, who, who end up, you know, showing the, the combat power of the British Army in at that stage of the war. As we've circled back round onto the learning curve, <laughs> that seems like a, a good place to, to to wrap things up. Where are we next time, Chris? I don't know. Um, we just had a big meeting about, um, like, the future. We're going to be talking, we're going for, from junior officers to women's work, aren't we? We're going to talk about textiles and threads. That's right. The, the, the promised day has come. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> and I will bring my knitting. What, if anyone wants to read along, what's the book we were you were you were, you sent us, Chris and I, for homework? Tracy Chevalier is a single thread. Mine is uh, has been dispatched and is working its way through the postal system towards me. Um, but also, obviously, this is going to go out. This episode, I mean, of course, this episode is going out in um, in in April because we're recording it, you know, fifteen minutes before it goes live and all those types of things. But um, check out if you haven't seen already um we've probably had a little discussion about kind of thoughts for the podcast's future on our twitter thread or on a twitter page so take a look at that about some things we're kind of we're pondering for for future evolutions and and the like to um yeah to allow us to do assorted fun things so if you're listening to this in april go and and dig out our our twitter thread from the very end of march well well, thank you charles that was uh that was really good fun Thank you. Enjoyed it. All right, guys. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Oh, it's a lovely walk. Oh, we must be and when we got plum and apple jam. Comfort, Richard, how can we spend the money we earn? Oh, 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 it's a lovely walk.